Hello, welcome to Design Insider's first audio recorded interview. This is a raw conversation so there are moments when the sound isn't as clear as I would have hoped. Although you can read our conversation below, we thought you might enjoy listening instead. And we would really love to know what you think of this new way of hearing from the commercial design sector. I'm Alice Bryan, editor of Design Insider. And just before Christmas, I had the pleasure of meeting with architects Holland Harvey and social enterprise Goldfinger after hearing about their approach to sustainable design at the Workplace Design Show. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So Richard, I heard you speak at the Workspace Design Show really passionately about how Holland Harvey Architects instill sustainability at the heart of many of your projects. Could you begin by introducing yourself and um, your studio and tell me a little bit more about what you do? Uh, sure. So um, we are Holland Harvey. We are uh, an architecture studio, but um, a large portion of our work is in the world of commercial interiors. Uh, typically sort of hospitality focused, food and beverage um, and then the other half of the business is kind of homes and we exist in that sort of grey area between the two. Everyone wants their house to feel like a hotel and hotels want to be the home away from home and obviously all of our restaurants and cafes and coffee shops they all kind of sit in that space between um, and that's the work that we enjoy and we work on projects ranging from sort of um, you know smaller um, smaller commercial fit outs um, all the way up to sort of 170 bedroom hotels uh, and everything in between um, we work with uh, we work on children's nurseries we work on medical clinics we're working on um, we work with lots of listed buildings and conservation areas and um, all sorts really predominantly in London um, but increasingly further afield either in the United Kingdom or we're actually doing quite a lot of work overseas at the moment with a couple of brands um, we are based here in, in Bethel Green and we're a team, uh, we're about 20, 22 people at the moment and sort of growing slightly. Um, we're 10 years old next year, which is rather insane to think <laughs> that we're nearly 10 years old. Um, and, uh, and yeah, what else have I said about the practice, John? I think, uh, I guess at the heart of our studio is, I guess, uh, social value, I guess, which is in a way, you know, intrinsically why we talk to Marie and Goldfinger, you know, I guess, whether it's working with, yeah, like amazing suppliers like Goldfinger or through our work with like Homeless Shelter, Shelter from the Storm, um, you know, it, uh, the whole studio was actually born out of an organisation called Free Architecture, which we tried to set up at, in 2012, which is about um, fostering um, energy and design talent across the industry. Um, and the idea was kind of based on this uh, place in the US called 1%, and it was all about if, if all the architects and designers uh, committed 1% of their time, um, there'd be a studio of 400 people working full time. So we we're like, well, how can we do it in the UK? There was this kind of really um, toxic environment, and it still exists really, of this kind of competition culture where hundreds of organizations c commit millions of pounds worth of design fees uh, for free to commercial entities. And we were like, well, why don't we give that time to uh, third sector organizations? So we tried to set up this organization. It never quite, you know, got rolling but Holland Harvey were kind of born out of that and uh, and so as this underpinning element which is part of sustainability you know it's the social sustainability of, of the project and its wider ecosystem uh, I guess that is a really kind of strong value that underpins the kind of work we do mm -hmm. um, I think that was kind of born the rich time at Sheffield University which is quite a kind of a strong kind of social kind of um, responsibility kind of background to it so I think that was kind of you know we were drawn to that same university at kind of architecture school which is uh, yeah, it's funny how that 20 years later, because that's when we yeah. met, how that kind of ends up still kind of front and centre in our studio and our work. And I guess when we started the practice, um, we were doing smaller projects and we were lucky enough to get to work with Gail's Bakery, who we still work with to this day. We've delivered quite a few <laughs> projects for them over the years and that's how we, we first started working with Goldfinger and we were introduced and it felt like, I think you guys were in the... Uh, beginning stages of your organisation about the same time we were and uh, it, it felt like there was a kind of synergy in the way that we thought about the world and the universe and, um, and there were a number of opportunities that we got to explore I guess our design interests and, and Goldfinger's uh, making abilities and wider sort of social impact um, uh, that's probably a nice segue to, to Marie to talk a bit about Goldfinger Absolutely, Marie perhaps as you've joined us here today, you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work you do for Goldfinger. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I'll start with uh, Marie um, Kudnet Carl, CEO and co-founder of Goldfinger, and we are a design-led social enterprise uh, uh, making sustainable furniture from the low, most low-carbon materials um, for homes and businesses, and, and similar to, to what Richard said, really working in that space of homes and hospitality and that sort of homes that look like hotels and hotels that look like homes um, and uh, how those two can, can marry very well. Um, and we reinvest all of our profits back into our local community. So we have um, our, our charitable initiatives are the Goldfinger Academy, which is our educational platform where we share our skills in traditional craftsmanship and sustainable design with uh, people of all ages and backgrounds, uh, ranging from 10 year old school children to um, elderly, vulnerable uh, people from our, from our community. And our soup kitchen, which is the people's kitchen, is run through our uh, on-site restaurant and we deliver meals, restaurant quality meals to um, the most vulnerable residents in, in the local community. It was an in-person meal pre-COVID, but since COVID we've been actually delivering to their doors uh, about 200 meals every Sunday um, during the lockdowns and, and once a month. So, very unusual uh, mix of furniture making, teaching, delivering meals, you know, so we put the food on the table, we make the table, we teach them how to make the table and we sell the table. <laughs> um, all the different elements of, of Goldfinger in a, in a nutshell. And, and yeah, we were very much started, uh, uh, well, we very similar trajectory. We were 2013, so about a year after uh, Holland Harvey. So we're, we, we've just celebrated our eight year anniversary. And, um, and it, yeah, it's always crazy to think about how, how time flies and, and also how much we've evolved because we, at the heart of our mission, the, our, our, the ethics and our sort of mission and purpose is always very clear, but the how has definitely evolved and um, in terms of there's a much more sort of elevated um, craft story um, that, that than our makers as well as uh, in terms of the high level bespoke joinery that we that we are offering now versus what we were offering possibly you know five six years ago um, and so um, there's been a great uh, alignment with with uh, a lot of the, the clients that Holland Harvey had brought to the table um, sort of you know four star plus aspiring hotels who really want that social and sustainability narrative but still want quality finished polished none of this rough and ready stuff so um so yeah i think i don't know do you do you, you you asked about me do you want to hear about yeah, me um so i um in a very short nutshell i i, I the, my my background is in um the luxury goods industry so I, i'm half french half chinese and i grew up in hong kong and that was very much the very formative years of my sustainability journey starting there being faced with a lot of uh, pollution and waste being just so omnipresent. Um, I remember being about eight and um, being on a boat and seeing this thing floating towards us and as we got closer I realized it was a fridge floating in the ocean just bobbing up and down. It was such a graphic image. I think I was only yeah, eight or something and it just really stayed with me that image of such a man-made problem. It was so obvious that someone had just pushed that fridge off and decided I'm done with this just throw it in the ocean and that we were damaging our planet and that 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 always stayed with me in all of my my early career in the luxury goods industry where I realized I was just selling beautiful objects yes but without a lot of story without a lot of meaning and uh, and that was really the the kind of the, the nugget of inspiration uh, my co-founder was was really interested in, in, in carpentry and into the social enterprise side and so with my luxury branding background and his um, social enterprise, sustainability, um, and, and my passion for sustainability, we kind of put the two together and realized there was a real gap in the market. There were no purpose-driven furniture brands um, that were really design-led and um, you know had a very strong um, purpose at the heart of it. It's amazing to hear what, how all of those aspects of the business, of the enterprise, all come together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic. And we're going to come back to um, the work that you do again in a moment. Um, Richard and Jonathan, sustainability is, and we'll get onto the, the nitty gritty of how you work with Goldfinger in a minute, but it, 
sustainability is really at the heart of most or all of your projects. Does that always been something that you've been interested in and passionate about? I think it's um, I think it's evolved as the practice has matured. I think when you're when a younger practice, you're you're just trying to make ends meet, quite frankly, uh, and then you get to quite a, f a fortunate position where we can interrogate our work uh, and we can interrogate the clients and the projects, and and in doing so, you know, that kind of that kind of reflection makes you makes you I guess establish your values and very much one of our values that's evolved over the last sort of um, five or so years I, I guess alongside the sort of the social impact that John talked about is the sustainability agenda and although it's not necessarily something that we put right at the front of our of our brand it's in a way it, for us it shouldn't be it should be a given in in the, in the work that we do you know um, the world is on fire and we all have a kind of duty to do something about it. We very much believe much more in a sort of fabric first approach to environmental, environmentally conscious design as opposed to sort of greenwashing and sticking solar panels and things on a building and you know it's much more about well you know tell me about the story of this table or that tile or that piece of carpet and where do we get it from, how long is it going to be in use and then what are we going to do with it afterwards. And so the story becomes much more sort of, I guess, embedded in the, the, there's a research and development element that happens in the studio when we're talking to suppliers and, and, and crafts people and makers, etc. And then it sort of it manifests itself as, a, as a, a piece, a product or a space. And then now, I guess, because we're 10 years old, we're, you know, in the position where sometimes we're refurbishing projects that we built 10 years ago and, you know, what happens to these things after their useful life in this particular space is over. And we're very much at the beginning of that process, I think. <clears throat> but um, one, of the, one of the brands specifically that I was talking about um, is, is a hotel chain that we work with called Inhabit. Um, and for them, sustainability is very much at the front of their of their brand and their agenda and um, also sort of wellness and but these things all kind of tie together and so they um, we've been working with Goldfinger and, and Inhabit for some time and they I guess give us the um, the capacity to undertake this research because there's a risk involved with you know a lot of these products they're very new to market um, they're not tried and tested you know we don't know how durable they're going to be over a 10 15 year period because they might have only come out last year you know what i mean so clients have to be comfortable with that risk and have you know hopefully a non litigious attitude to that risk if something were to not quite turn out the way it has and certainly inhabit for us has been one of the brands that's allowed us that space to explore those ideas and those products and in doing so that's why we thought that was a great um opportunity to introduce Goldfinger to the client and as a result we've developed this furniture range which now is a product that Goldfinger are actually bringing to market so that you can you know you can sit at this beautiful table in this conscious socially conscious environmentally conscious hotel and then you can actually go home and buy that table and have it in your house as well so it's just trying to think about how the wider reach of your projects as well because ultimately we can we can obsess about the specification of a tile or a piece of furniture or whatever it is, and we can we can make a tiny little scratch, a tiny little indent on on the problem. But actually, your your wider opportunity is to educate people beyond that single project. And I think, you know, what Goldfinger are doing with the furniture range, it allows you to kind of take a piece home and tell your friends, you know, and, and eventually that sort of that has a much wider impact than us making a really lovely hotel reception, for example. So there's, there's many, many facets to it. It's not just about checking the you know, credentials of a product before you specify it in a, in a, in a, in a set of drawings. It's, it's like what comes before, what comes after, and how that message can pervade and sort of have a, a much wider impact. I think you know, what you say about kind of client, you know, the Inhabit client being so forward thinking and open to um, trying some of these new products and I think in a way that's what's changed over the last five years is that that conversation was always there in the studio but a lot of the time the client didn't that's see the value true. in it and often it was more expensive mm -hmm. and it's only now that we're seeing the larger manufacturers really starting to provide a product range which we can design you know, you know we design a concept at the beginning of a project 
that concept kind of drives is the vehicle for that project right the way through. And 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 if ultimately you know sometimes that concept you know the, the sustainability thing shouldn't be the concept. That's not the the tail that wags the dog. It's you know is it about the fact that that site was a historic site that was originally an Art Deco lighting factory and so forth. The concept is about that. Well, you know, maybe there wasn't the material palette that just would work for that project, project which was sustainable. Well, now there is a wood rider range. They are perhaps actually in the price, you know, in the com we're, in, we're talking about the kind of commercial interiors mm. furniture world where price and robustness is really important to clients. Clients will not pay £400 for a chair, even if it is beautifully and sustainable, because actually that one chair, you know, it needs to come from a contract chair company, it has to have a two year guarantee. And but now the bigger manufacturers are really, I guess, getting behind, I guess, certain elements of it, which gives us the ability to have that conversation with the client, or not even have the conversation with the client. You know, you can you can specify a project, and 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 it aligns with the concept, and, and actually inherently it is there. And so some sometimes the clients are now much more buying into it. Now I'm not saying they don't always have to, because our agenda can come through without necessarily that conversation being explicit. Yeah. So it's 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 almost taken this, you know, that the world is on fire kind of point to kind of realise that much more of the clients are open to have that conversation. Many of them see it's really important. And now, actually, they also, not all of them want to necessarily just greenwash their project. So they don't necessarily want to talk about it. And if they talk about it, it needs to be completely green. So it's almost like, well, guys, yes, we really want you to. And we're not going to talk about it particularly outwardly unless it's completely. But we will, you know, but please, yes, always. And so we're saying to our clients that we're, going to, we're building up our, you know, supplier ranges. We're really thinking about how we find alternatives to, you know, I think Inhabit was an amazing example of how they sent a lot of the plasterboard to landfill because actually plaster, uh, not they avoided, sorry, they didn't send it to landfill, it was recycled. There was ways for it to be reused, you know, cementitious, you know, you know Goldfinger are in a fortunate position, they, they have, they're amazing workers of wood and wood can, in, as long as you source it correctly, is inher inherently a sustainable material. And, and I think I'll let Marie talk more about, you know, the, the stuff the they do, but you know, yeah. you know, there's some stuff which is just cementitious stuff it's hard mm. to avoid and steal. Mm. It's hard to avoid sometimes. It's, it's like, well, how do you, again, in that first step, talk to your client about how we avoid, you know, how, how do we take steps in setting up the project right? Um, and now they are starting to be more open to them, so those conversations are a little bit easier. Um, but it is always still comes down to like, they don't want to spend necessarily more on their project because they are, you know, they have a, a CapEx, which has been signed off mm -hmm. by a board of directors, which meets an objective of a financial return over a number of years, you know, it's, and it starts, all the way over here, so there's no, you know, that, so there's no, there's no room. You can't say, oh, well, I'd like to spend more, please, on this, on this floor. Then, like, well, no, it's not. <laughs> it doesn't work for our financial model. And so, but, but yeah, I think because there's now, yeah, more available, more out there, it's making it easier. More awareness and more mm. pressure as well on, on, because it really is, as you say, it's client-led, and yeah. and if the client is the one willing to put more money in into it then it allows for more experimentation and because it's impossible for us small businesses to do all of that research out of our own pockets and so thankfully there are some uh you know brave and, and risk-taking uh, clients like inhabit who are willing to be, really put their money in their mouth in space. And, and those clients are dri driven by their consumers like ultimately it comes That's down it. to the people you know if uh if a sustainable hotel brand is someone's going to prefer to stay there over just a kind of a standard run-of-the-mill non-sustainable hotel brand then you know vote with your pound to coin a phrase and th that client is going to suddenly see the value of oh maybe we should be thinking about hospitality in this way and hopefully there's kind of a, a shift in, in, in just the mentality of the general population to make more kind of conscious choices with the money they spend and you know I've got I could go to two coffee shops and one is fair trade roasted beans and one is just you know supermarket roasted beans or whatever you you probably go for the you know the one that's got a bit of a story and the same applies now i think to interiors as people <coughs> become more aware of uh, of the damage that we are doing in stripping out these buildings every 10 years and completely redoing them and chucking mm. everything to landfill or throwing fridges in the ocean like can't carry on you know yeah. can't and, and um there will there, you will get to a point where you know, government regulation and people will step in to stop it happening. But at the moment, we're still just kind of, everyone's a little bit nervous to make any commitment at that high level. So, you know, the industry as a profession, we just kind of have to step in and do it for ourselves. And then the suppliers and the manufacturers are kind of starting to move in that direction as well. But it's wonderful to hear that each individual person's choices eventually is build, are building up to have an impact. 
And it's also wonderful to hear that um, furniture and product and material suppliers are launching the types of products that meet the requirements that you want to achieve for your projects. When you're looking for those projects, for those suppliers, what specifications are you looking for? I had, I think, the Workspace Show, for example, was a great opportunity to just go around and talk very openly, you know, it's not a sales pitch necessarily, but it's just people that know their products and, and you could ask them directly, you know, well, what are your credentials? Because actually I'm working with this hotel brand and they're looking for a carpet that is, you know, cradle to cradle, you know, tell me about your product. Uh, and I met some amazing people who were doing things that I couldn't even dream of. Um, carpet, you know, carpet suppliers, uh, making carpet out of uh, old um, fishing nets and recycled bottles and uh, and then once that carpet is is, is, is done, you know, you, when this, when the contractor starts to peel it away, there's a label on the back with a phone number and you call the number and the supplier will come and pick up the carpet and they'll take it back to their factory, separate into their component parts, run it through their machine, turn it into new carpet, sell it to someone else and you're just like, wow, you know, there, there is an infrastructure around this. Um, there are certain like certifications like cradle to cradle and you know within the architecture industry there's Briam, there's Well, there's within hospitality there's Green Key, you know there are um, sort of badges that we can wear um, but you know um, I, I think it's it's still hard to find I think some of the, really like dig into to those companies I think um, you know, there isn't sort of a one catch-all certification, um, but I'm sure especially it in our industry, I think yeah, there's like like there was organic and fair trade, and for the for food, um, and this is actually a really interesting uh, segue to sort of some of our sourcing and some of the issues that we find with certification because. Um, so we, we work with um, a whole range of different, you know, people say, well, what is sustainable about your wood? I mean, yes, Jonathan said, by definition, wood is sustainable, but there are different grades of it, because obviously just cutting down virgin wood endlessly and having it shipped from the US or Eastern Europe is not that sustainable. And so we are sort of fiercely British woods only. We work with only native species, as well as reclaimed woods. Um, so the reclaimed woods is basically woods that have genuinely had another life as a piece of furniture or something else before. And so that's from a whole host of network partners like construction companies, retailers like Harvey Nichols donated a whole bunch of cedar from their Christmas windows in 2019. Uh, Imperial College, the so universities, uh, museums donated a, a whole bunch of teak. Imperial had these teak desks that they've had in there since the 1950s. And that's a really interesting one because obviously teak isn't a wood that we would normally work with, very much not local, very much not sustainable. It's one of the most rare, precious, but value, valued woods for obvious reasons. It's beautiful and it's very durable. And so to get that reclaimed, it's a really interesting narrative how sustainability is very much about provenance and where it comes from. And there's an, a fascinating statistic that the, the amount of energy it takes to, or well, the sort of carbon footprint released from cutting down a ton of virgin wood versus a ton of using a ton of reclaimed wood in furniture is a factor of one to 10. So it's basically 10 times more uh, carbon efficient or you know, it produces less carbon if you're using reclaimed wood. Um, and so that's been a kind of at the core of our business since we met in the very early, early years. Um, and then there's on, on this side, there's the kind of FSC, PFC certifications mm -hmm. of ensuring that if you're using new, you're using it from the most renewable, you know, well-managed forests, but nevertheless, it's still cutting down new trees. Mm -hmm. And so over the last two to three years, we've been developing a lot of different networks and partners and developing our supply chain so that we can, we've basically identified this new source of wood that is from felled trees. There's a huge amount of trees that fall down for, uh, because of a storm, because of, they have to be cut down because of disease, um, all they are felt for urban development and just to give you like a scope just in London alone there's about 5,000 trees that get cut um, per year and guess what happens to them most of the time mm -hmm. they get chipped and incinerated exactly which releases so much carbon into the air and so there's this you know we've started sort of identifying this this opportunity mm -hmm. that actually we just need to connect the tree surgeons 
with the timber merchants who have the kilns and who have who can season the wood and and so we're now able to pretty much exclusively only use that wood and um, that kind of fell fallen tree wood uh, with enough timber merchants and suppliers and tree surgeons um, because there's trees that are full I mean just in the last two weeks we've had over a hundred trees donated just because of they fell down during storms Whoa. a lot of estate owners who just are like what do i do with it? our trees and our, our you know our our manifesto is from tree to table which you and it's very much you know talking and i invite you to go look at the website um everyone okay tree falling down <laughs> tree falling down. Down. <laughs> <laughs> go get it up to it um and uh you know really tracking the journey of a of a, of a of a, you know how a table you know original your table was once a tree you know it starts off and um, and what's interesting is that that wood doesn't have any certification at the moment so although it's infinitely more sustainable than FSC it doesn't have the certification at the moment so what what, what we do have with that is a grown in Britain and made in Britain so are the two certifications that we can kind of align with um, and a lot of our partners are, are to working on that with everything certification is quite expensive um, and another one which I don't know if it is kind of quite new but is the B Corp one which is increasingly getting a lot of uh, air time and is definitely very slow in this so it's a um, uh, originally uh, global what's really great about it is um, it's global uh, unlike every of uh, these other things a cradle to cradle is quite global but they're usually US centric or started there um, and it's basically the highest standards of social environmental practices that a business can take. And so um, businesses as wide ranging as like Coots Bank have become a B Corp, um, but Inhabit Hotel has, is a B Corp. It's basically a real badge of approval and it's very, very hard to get it. It's not just a case of just paying and, and off you go. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. It's really, really time consuming and onerous. It's, and it's really going through the whole ESG stuff, environmental, social governance, making sure that your board is as diverse and, uh, but to everything to like what kind of faucets you have in your kitchen are they low flow you know it's really really quite in depth looking at your carbon footprint as a, a business but also your entire supply chain um, so that's an interesting one that that um, is worth looking at in terms of even though it's obviously not interior design or furniture mm -hmm. specific at all it's it's general business but I think um, we're going to be hearing a lot more about it because it really is becoming quite um, and it's the only accreditation that is yeah. truly global well certainly Doing like research into mm -hmm. that. We were looking into it, it is really onerous, like it's an aspiration for our studio, but yeah, as, as you say, there's a lot of work to be done. I think one thing I do like about the B Corp is it, it gives you an inherent network, you know, and if you if you only operate them within that network, immediately you, your embodied carbon is going to be lower than anyone else. So, in a way, that's for us, that would be the value is that we, you know, if we were to only source our supplies, supply chain within. B Corp, B Corp exactly. and our clients were like, you know, you've got a B Corp hotelier who wants a B Corp architect who's who going to specify B Corp, B Corp, Corp tiles and a B Corp it. furniture maker. And I see you, the world you know, evolving that way. You just, you just know that it's all, it's it's all, all good. good. Yeah. The due diligence is done for you. Know, yeah, exactly. All that hard mm. work, all that R&D, the risk is just mitigated. So I think there's... there'll be a huge take up. But I do think they need to simplify it. It's, with the energy and anyway, that's it's a balance. It's a balance, um, I guess, because it needs to mean something. It needs to be meaningful as well, yeah, and yeah, therefore you need to go through checks. But I guess the bigger it gets, the larger. How do you like make sure that? <coughs> you, know, you know, like the way Brienne went. Like Brienne's got different grades, and you know, if you go Brienne, yeah. whatever. But you can also just do Brienne fit out, which mm. is not worrying about the building fabric so much. And I don't know. Maybe there needs to be some fragmentation. Mm. That's not for me to say. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're listening, be cool. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, at Holland Harvey, you use Goldfinger and um, Marie's Amazing Service within your projects. And I really want to ask um, Marie to talk me through the furniture collection in a minute, but what other ways have you, have you been able to work together? Um, well, it's, it's, it's mainly through furniture, joinery, pieces. Um, we've done uh, lots of bakeries together. Um, mm -hmm. We've done Inhabit. We've done... Um, we did uh, the, the, the Japanese, the Japanese mid stall, medieval thing, stand. Um, no joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah the moving Japanese pancake 
think. Um, I think it's just, you know, I, I think we love introducing... And some residential. And some residential. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we've you remember made, Nina? Yeah. 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 yeah, we did the big table. Exactly. Yeah. And, Zena, yeah. and we, we, we kind of, we've gone through COVID, we've actually gone... We, I think like you, we kind of went, actually, commercial hospitality is our thing. But COVID went, oh, actually, residential is pretty cool, too. Yeah. <laughs> because it's all there is right now. And actually, close, so. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think with residential, it's, it's less budget. When you get to the right client, mm -hmm. again, with the, and all, you know, so very much our cu target customers is that um, customer who, who wants the most sustainable thing and is pretty much willing to pay anything for it because they're and actually they like being part of the research and, yeah. and you know discovering something together and and that that is again when you can really push the boat out on really doing some very very beautiful things that that are where there isn't so much of a budget and so for, for better or for worse because also there's sometimes less of a, a deadline so things mm -hmm. can, can go on forever yeah. but, um, but the residential market is very interesting in terms of um, the, again, because it's so client-led, it's their home, they're usually willing to, to spend more because they're going to be around it, and it's a, a centerpiece for them to go, I did this, and I commissioned from that, and it comes from that tree. And um, So there's a lot more kind of um, emotiveness, I think, with, with, with residential furniture. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And the longevity of the product, product is, is good there. Exactly. Um, so the furniture collection that you worked on together, um, was that for the Inhabit Hotels yes. brand? Uh, was it a seating collection or is it a table collection? It's tables, tables. probably. So it came, yeah. it came about, um, we we were working together on Inhabit. So we're, we're now doing the second hotel for them, which opens in the new year. But the first Inhabit hotel that we UK did. Hotel? Yeah, it's just around the corner from the first one. It's in Paddington. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we will be using a lot of the pieces. Um, have you seen the CGI's, by the way? Not all of them. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'd love to see they them. Because feature, obviously, quite yeah, that'd be great. Um, I, I'm seeing the f actual furniture being made there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <you're seeing laughs> really I'm just yeah. getting computer-generated images of it. Can I see the real thing? Yeah, come, um, and, come and see it. Yeah, so that, I guess, we, we designed, you know, we designed all this beautiful furniture. We'd been paid by our client to design this beautiful furniture, and Goldfinger had spent a lot of time finessing it and, mm. and, and making it, a, you know, a physical thing. And we made a handful of these items and we put them in a beautiful hotel and it was very well received and it became part of the design hotels portfolio and it was in uh, El Deck and Dezine and Wallpaper Magazine and everyone was talking about it and then it was like well, this can't be it you know th 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 this is insane. silly um, and actually it was kind of a bit of a COVID project and uh, myself and we had a conversation just like well could, could we feasibly make this like a, a product collection. that we could sell as sort of you know, retail basically, um, and so the client very, um, very kindly agreed. You know, obviously they paid for the design, so there's there's an ownership to them. But you know, they were like, we'll, we'll call it the inhabit table, and there was a range, rest, pause, and come on the other one. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's kind of branded as the the inhabit range, but it you know designed by Holland Harvey, made by Goldfinger. Um, and then when we did the second hotel, we we're like, well, you know, actually there are some new pieces in the there new are, hotel. Yeah. And there's some pieces that don't exist from the first hotel, but then there's obviously um, other items that are just replicants of, of, of mm -hmm. what was in the first site. Um, and, it's, and it kind of makes sense, you know, why do all that again when, when there is a range of furniture that, that, that exists and works for this client and if they're going to do more hotels, that will perpetuate the amount of furniture in those hotels. And then we can obviously, their guests can come and stay and be like, oh, this is a really beautiful coffee table. Well, you can buy it and you can support uh, an amazing social enterprise. So mm -hmm. it kind of all, it kind of all made sense. So Marie, how does that work with the reclaimed timber? Does the design accommodate any timber type, or have you uh, a sufficient supply from timber that that collection can be made in that way? Yeah, we, we have, uh, so when we launched it, so they were made in oak for the mm -hmm. hotel, and when we launched it, we thought it would be nice to offer it in several different woods that mm -hmm. we knew we had sufficient access to, and so they're available, uh, this collection, certainly in ash, oak, and walnut, um, that we're all able to source um, locally in the UK, yeah, which is, which is amazing, exactly. Um, and um, and then sometimes it's just a, a lead time thing, but it may be a bit longer. Although ash, we have a plentiful supply of because you know, if you know about the ash dieback, yeah, yeah there's a lot of trees dying. So we have a lot of ash, which is great. 
And it's so beautiful, exactly. And thankfully, it's very popular at the moment. Um, and to be honest, in many ways, it can look so similar to Oak as well. So, um, so that's great. And um, and so it was a real just test. I think you know we were getting a lot of uh, questioning and pressure from our from our board, like. You, you design all these amazing pieces and then that's it they're gone they're just off in their home and their hotel and then you know we never and, and we and so it was just a very realizing that the product development is almost paid for by the client and you, we basically spoke to a lot of our clients and they were all delighted to, to have it out into the world yeah. and sometimes be part of naming it and so it's allowed us to basically launch our retail collection of, of basically Here's the design, but you can customize it. So it's minor customizing of wood, you know, the material uh, and the size, basically. Because the one of the tables we did for Inhabit was, I think, four meters long. Yes, big. And so it's big. Yeah. So yeah, really <laughs> not, big not a classic residential size. Yeah. Um, and and you know, it takes a while to establish yourself. You know, as a, we we very much are known as a bespoke maker, and so the retail side. Is, has been new and it's only in the last two months, three months that we've, since launching them a year ago, that we're actually starting to see sales come through. Oh, really? But they, they are, are coming but through. they are coming through, oh, which brilliant. is really it's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's your own craftspeople that make the that's furniture. right. And who who trains them? Where do those people come from? And who trains them? So the ones who are full time employed are extremely skilled, and I am not. No one trains them. They are they are okay. masters. Uh, and, and that's why the quality is what it is. Um, the apprenticeships, uh, which is through the Goldfinger Academy, are young people um, from the community who often have no skills, who um, come and uh, basically do some, some work experience type things. But we've, um, they used to work on the bespoke side of it, but we have since realized it was, it was, it was causing a lot of bottlenecks. Because we're such a small team as it is to have one apprentice to one full-time maker is distracting the full-time maker from the work that he needs to be doing and it's such high level craftsmanship and joinery that a lot of the time the, the apprentice would be just watching and not necessarily so we're relaunching our apprenticeship to be more focused on object making so the small that we have a whole our retail platform at the beginning was all small objects like chopping oh. boards, coasters, bowls. Uh, so um, the apprenticeship is going to be um, around that rather than the bespoke furniture projects where effectively they're just watching because you can't expect someone with no... And it's also, there's too high risk to have someone who doesn't have the skills to be having a go at a £10,000 table. <laughs> so, um, there's one, so we, there's one particular cool. table in the, new, in the new hotel, the reception, well, yeah. is... I mean, it's going to be a work of art. Yeah, I know. I can't <laughs> we, wait to I see it. I don't think we could have it's made it any so more complicated if we tried. <laughs> it's got about a thousand curves. It's a very organic shape. It's beautiful. Multifaceted. It's kind of like big elephant's leg. It's um, that's it going to be particularly special. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see it. I know. Um, me but too. Yeah, you don't want the last, the last yeah. kind of little, the last plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry, that was a. Oh, that's not so sustainable. We're going to replace the top. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. Um, so re-looking it, there's a lot of romantic ideas of, oh, apprentices working on, and it, it, yes, but just on a different side of it. And so they, they, they make chopping boards and, and coasters and things that are repetitive and where it's a bit simpler because the thing with bespoke is also every product is different. Um, and so... Um, but then the apprentices can hone their skills and learn on their Exactly, yeah. and then hopefully yes. graduate. Yeah, and it's exactly. all about like role models. So they're working yeah. in an environment they with people see, yeah. who have this respect for these people. They look and look up to because exactly. I guess sometimes they, perhaps they don't have that all necessarily in their background. And you see the value of learning Making, a trade, yeah. becoming an expert, mm -hmm. something that you can see is very accessible to you because it's about skills which you're learning already. So it's like I think being in that environment, in a professional environment. It's quite inspiring. It's, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And we try to give them as much of that real world experience, so that you know if they're coming on site, or so they can observe all of that. Um, but just keeping, you know, from the quality control perspective, uh, them away from those mega commissions. Sounds like very sensible <laughs> evolution. Is what you've yes. already started. So, um, Richard and John. What does the future hold for the sustainable standards at Holland and Harvey? So I think we're post COVID. We're in a period of um, uh, kind of refocusing, um, as I talked about earlier. And I think 
we've identified um, kind of calling them rocks, <laughs> which is you know um, kind of key goals that we intend to sort of focus on every 90 days is our plan and I think our sustainability agenda is very much one of those rocks and something that we want to genuinely commit more time to and to you know how do we get to a point where it's our baseline you know what I mean um, and projects like Inhabit have given us an opportunity to do to gain a huge amount of knowledge and expertise and it's you know it's taking that and it's uh, making sure that everyone in the in the company is aware and that, that, that those items those suppliers become their go-to is like a starting point and then that library you know John described it as a library it just gets built upon and, and that becomes our kind of own sort of private network of do-gooders if you like um, obviously that will not encompass every single product skill supplier that we need so we'll obviously be popping outside of that but I think just really kind of establishing, you know, um, yeah, a baseline kind of core network of people is something that we would like to do. Yeah, I think it's like it's going to be. There's like a sustainability. I guess we've identified that we we need. You know, there are key things in the studio that we need, like uh, as like kind of champions for. And historically, they would be things like um, kind of CAD and IT development and. Um, Health and safety, and uh, I don't know, quality management. But now we now we, so we've now created a, we want a, a sustainability champion. So, that, so there would be out of four pillars, of which that and that person, I guess, his role is to ensure that we have got, you know everybody. You know, and in my mind, it's like there's 20 people in this room. There's probably going to be 25, 30 people by the end of next year. That's if everyone said, it, let's say everyone finds for every year five really good suppliers of, of something sustainable every year. That's you know, that would be 120 suppliers every year in five years time that's 500 mm. different things that we can use place you know and if we set that as a goal so that person is kind of making sure that's happening then it's you know we have a CPD, CPD program every week that someone comes in and we find someone and that you know so the key thing is every month one you know out all those out four CPDs a month one person comes in and does a sustainability present something about you know, and it could be about yeah, credit credit on life cycle. You know, it's ha you know because ultimately, you know, we we're, we're all still constantly growing our knowledge, and we need to bring people externally to help us grow that knowledge. Um, so I think you know, it's, it's knowledge, and you know, and this kind of life. You know, we have a material library <laughs> full of thousands, and hundreds of materials, which we, and, and I think it's like you know, really, every single material in that library should be sustainable. I mean, it's not, but it, but we need to. I think it's like it's about the driving that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, There's actually some really useful tools, so um, we're at RIBA Chartered Practice, the RIBA has these amazing toolkits and one of them is, is like a brief tracker, so at stage one, you know, the initial, <coughs> the initial engagement with a client on a project, you can actually record your sort of sustainability agenda for that, for that project and you can sort of, I don't know, your 10 key points or your metrics, you know, what are your actual targets in terms of embodied carbon or whatever it might be. And then it tracks them through the stages and through you know your concept design stage, your spatial coordination, your technical design. At every point, you're referring back to that initial document and you're like, are we delivering on these initial aspirations? Mm -hmm. And that's all part of sort of a wider quality management system that we have within the studio. But actually, really useful that you get to technical design and you're like, okay, we're talking about these tiles, we're talking about this table. You know, what's specified? Oh, this. Well, does it satisfy? this original intent which was for it, for it to be I don't know the metric was that it had to be cradle to cradle certified no okay well then it's the wrong tile you know go back and find another one crudely um, so I think it's just having those like really like rigorous robust systems in place and having a bit of an accountability in the studio for the people that are making those decisions and just making sure that it, it, it gets followed through all the way accountability is so Definitely. And obviously there's nuances to that, you know, you need your client to buy into that and they should be part of that brief writing process. Mm -hmm. And then obviously there'll be a financial reality to that brief that they'll probably realise a couple of stages later. And they may, you know, inevitably be like, oh, maybe this is getting a bit expensive, maybe this is the first thing that was going to be on their list. And it's like, you know, really standing up for it. And, 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 and I think the more we do that as the practice, the types of client that we attract, the types of projects that we work on, will inevitably sort of start to gravitate towards that world, and that's a that's a nice place we want to be. We don't want to be doing sort of evil corp, you know, toxic awfulness, you know. Um, but hopefully, those people, all the people that wouldn't weren't talking about it and weren't as interested, will see that will see that work also and be inspired to, to go that yeah, way too. So yeah. that you know, there's a 
and see the commercial value in it as, as, as their clients, as their customers exactly. start to ex- have that expectation that it's going to so be definitely on the commercial side, exactly. Especially if you know, let's say, so uh, Gale is a, is a quite good example. Isn't it? If you, you know, we, we're using a lot more sustainable products with, with them, and we're we're having they're, they're really interested in it. You know, they you know, they 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 were interested in working. You know, they were with Golfing back in the beginning, and that's how we met. That's exactly that's yeah. how we met. So like, so they're really kind of good stories. Like, and, and in their kind of commercial success. I think you know you talk about that with other clients, and then they say, like, "Oh, if, if Gales can do it, or if Farm J can do it, or if Pressing, you know, they can do it, or so can we." It will. I think they, they, all the players in commercial are always looking at each other, and, mm-hmm. and so yeah, it doesn't take a couple to then everyone's like, "Oh, we better do it. Yeah. We have to." So, Marie, what can we look forward to seeing from Goldfinger uh, in the near future? Um, so, well, it's. Uh, a bit more of a this is the sort of more public um, library of, of all the different woods that we are and, and I think being able to tell the story of really what it takes to get um, you know a tree that falls down and that being able to fill out a form on our website say I have this tree here's a photo this is where it's located to then be able to tell our network of partners and they can go and collect it and, and really having that full traceability. Um, so there's that. Then there's also um, launching uh, retail collections um, at least twice a year uh, of sort of collections of products, families of products that um, sometimes are um, born out of a bespoke commission from, from a commercial or residential client. But then we'll, it may be a table and then we'll build out a whole family of you know the stool, the bench. Um, and just having more of that um, a catalog because I think a lot of interior designers will come to us and go you know I want to see what is it that you do rather than not everyone has the kind of bespoke um, head on them and they're really a lot of interior designers that well are not furniture designers so they just want to pick from a catalog and go that's pretty that's yeah. pretty that's pretty uh, and it's it's lovely to work with with architects interior designers who who do have that and where it can really be a collaborative um, Effort to to design some pieces together, and uh, so there'll be there'll be more um, Holland Harvey, uh, you know, inhabit uh, pieces uh, coming out probably yeah in the in the second half of um, of twenty twenty two, and we'll let inhabit launch first and then release them. So we yeah. very much look forward to um, <laughs> to seeing those. So thank you all so much for um, your time and your knowledge. Uh, today and for meeting me on such a dark, rainy, rainy day. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Absolute pleasure.